And uh, since we have a small enough room, um, I have to speak into the microphone, even though there's only like 10 of us here because they're recording. Um, but I can introduce myself personally and just find out who is here. Um, so I'm, I'm Ryan Zarama, the um, CTO for Commerce at Commerce Guys. Uh, we are a Drupal company with two business units, Platform.sh being a hosting platform, and then, of course, the Drupal Commerce business where we build and deliver Drupal-based e-commerce products and services. Um, and so in the room, do I have – I know that there are some business owners – who actually like sort of drives the strategy of a business here, either in a technical capacity or a business capacity? Just a few, somewhat, yeah. And then, uh, are we developers mostly, or yeah, yeah? Okay, cool. Um, good, good to have you. Um, this is only the second time in my life, come on in, um, that I've made it into uh, to South America. I have been to Ecuador as well, and I still carry around my llama purse that I bought 13 years ago as my laptop bag. It's sentimental. <laughs> Um, but I, I love being here, um, and it's certainly been a pleasure so far to eat and drink and explore Bogota. Um, so to, to introduce myself personally, um, I am married, father of two, and um, really all that my family gets to enjoy and eat and the house we get to live in is all thanks to Drupal. Um, my career basically began at the point that I discovered Drupal. Um, prior to that, I was selling uh, blenders on eBay. Um, so I started... Um, actually writing an e-commerce um, product for Drupal called Ubercart, um, which may be familiar because it uh, started in Drupal 5 um, back in 2006. Um, and it was not like, there was no business behind it, but we had a cool logo and a lot of character. <laughs> um, and, and we really um, just kind of did services here and there, but mostly just embraced the Drupal community and, and learned what it looked like to build um, an e-commerce system in community, which um, basically looks like a lot of feature creep or scope creep because everyone has an idea about what it could do differently or better. Um, and so uh, it wasn't bad, though, because I learned a lot and got to learn from, you know, some of the best people in the Drupal community, like Dries and Larry and um, Eaton and, uh, you know, uh, Earl Miles, who created Views, and all, Mosh, who did the Migrate Launch, all these guys that really... Um, kind of uh, helped me learn and grow as a developer and then also um, as a business person. Um, so in 2009, at DrupalCon DC, um, I decided to actually build a business around Drupal-based e-commerce. At the time, it was Ubercart, and I had um, two partners that we signed the paperwork in our hotel room um, in Washington, DC, and officially launched the business there. And then quickly, at the end of that year, we... we um, had a successful e-commerce project with a, with a French company called AF83. Did anybody go to DrupalCon Paris? Josh, you did, yeah? AF83 were some of the organizers, and they had a Drupal team, about 45 uh, Ruby on Rails people and 15 Drupal people. And so their Drupal people came out. We merged to create Commerce Guys, um, headquartered in Paris. Um, and then now we have offices in London and in Ann Arbor, Michigan, in the U.S., and then the whole point behind merging and joining forces was to raise venture capital to build Drupal-based e-commerce products and, and deliver services as well. Um, so the money was spent at least initially um, scaling the team, um, so, so hiring sales staff and some project management. Um, but then over time, we were able to use more of the money building out our own products using Drupal or for Drupal. And of course, it all began with Drupal Commerce, and that's, that was launched in 2010 to basically replace Ubercart as a more flexible framework on which we could deliver websites um, but also build products. Um, so before I talk about the specific products that, that we've tried and failed to develop um, or are developing and have launched, um, I want to just take a step back and think about the different categories of Drupal products. Um, because I, I think... Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really sure, you know, what, what a Drupal-based product looks like to you. Um, one category that I think we're all familiar with um, would be the, the full Drupal platform. And this is, some, this is where, you know, Drupal developers create a hosting and development platform for Drupal developers. And it's, and it's oriented around optimizing um, development workflows and DevOps and, you know, introducing tool sets like Drush and Drush Make, which is at the heart of platform. Um, to manage your code base. And, and really, these, these are tools that you, know, you could never actually build them with Drupal, um, but all of them host Drupal websites and other types of sites like WordPress, and um, we host just uh, um, bare-bones Symfony applications and others. Um, but this is one product category that I won't really be talking about in this session um, because, honestly, to build something like this requires vast amounts of money. 
Um, I know that uh, you know Acquia has raised some, you know, seventy-five million dollars to date. Pantheon has raised about thirty. Commerce Guys has raised about ten. You know, these these are this is just the the scale of money you need to be able to hire engineers and have them build a big platform over the course of many years. It's just very expensive, um, and you know, it's it's not personally interesting um, because I, I actually. Um, I, I like to run lean. I'm, I'm more a fan of bootstrapping in the lean startup. And so we'll get to where I see Drupal being useful for that. Um, but the next type of product category is really deeply integrated tools, where there's a third-party tool that would have applicability to Drupal users. Um, but because it's not integrated well, it, it's, it's, um, it's just not used by our community. And so Veloci, does anybody know Veloci or Automator? I'm not sure how, how, how far their reach extends. Veloci was really the first Drupal business to specialize in SEO, in content marketing, and search engine marketing. Um, they really specialized in that, but, w but wanted to escape the never-ending cycle of services delivery and get into product development where they can have recurring revenue and predictable you know, sales. And so they, they found a, uh, an automated marketing solution, and they deeply integrated it into Drupal and call it Automator. And so I think for about 500 bucks a month or wherever they start, you end up with really, really robust marketing tools built into the back end of Drupal, integrated into rules, into your views displays, and all that stuff. So you can basically customize the whole front end experience of the website based on what you know about your visitors and your customers. Um, Acquia Lift is a similar tool um, that um, Acquia has developed for site personalization. And I'm sure that there are others that, that I'm missing. Um, now, getting closer to, to where I have a personal interest is um, Node Squirrel. Has anybody heard of this? This is, this is basically a, a module with a value-added service. So the, the people who created the backup and migrate module, have we used that to backup our site database and download, you know, schedule automated backups? They actually um, created a service called Node Squirrel, where in the, in the module itself, you put in your API key, and you can automatically backup your entire Drupal site off-site to their cloud servers. Um, so, so it gives you redundant backups. They're off-site, so if your web server goes down and your backups aren't destroyed with it. Um, and, and I think there's some other interesting like, workflow opportunities. So um, imagine, for example, a development project where you create a site, you back it up to Node Squirrel, and then somebody else is able to restore your precise you know, version of the site using Node Squirrel into their local environment. That, that can be kind of interesting. But what they've done is they, they've taken a module that they developed and maintain and actually put a business model right into the module itself and it's actually a very valuable service that um, uh, you know, is actually you know, doing really well. Um, and then we come to uh, what Commerce Guys is, is actually um, done one of, and a few other folks have really gone big on, and that's Drupal distributions. And we probably don't think of Drupal distributions as products because you don't have to pay for them. Um, we all know that we can go to drupal.org and download the Red Hin you know, profile, the Commerce Kickstart, Open Atrium. Um, and th th there's, there's not like a, an inherent business model to a distribution. Now, one thing you could do is decide to host a distribution and charge someone to maybe access a locked down version of Open Atrium. Or if you consider Pantheon, they actually let you one-click install a variety of installation profiles. And I happen to know that they make decent money doing so because we're an affiliate and we actually get money from Pantheon on a monthly basis based on you know, our referrals um, for people that are using Kickstart. So that there, there is money to be made. But the distributions themselves don't have an inherent business model, and historically they've been more of a lead generation tool for a services business than um, something that someone's just made a lot of money on. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about you know, our experience at Commerce Guys um, when I get to that slide. Um, finally, and this is actually my, what I believe to be the most exciting opportunity for Drupal-based product businesses, you have the, the um, Drupal-based software as a service. Um, so this, this company here is BioRaft. I met the, um, the owners at DrupalCon Barcelona in 2007. They're still going strong. They're actually hiring and growing very rapidly right now. And what they did <coughs> is they decided that Drupal would be the perfect, um, essentially, application portal to service um, a market that they knew, which was lab uh, laboratories. So laboratory compliance and testing and um, accounting and just you know, everything that goes into running a medical or research laboratory they have used Drupal to create an application portal for them. And you can even see it in the, uh, in the word here, right? In, in the, um, the marketing, BioRaft modules. Every new feature that they put into their platform is actually a module that an individual user of the system can turn on and off. And they actually, um, they actually developed this on the, on the backs of live customer engagements. 
So they have, I think, a, a dozen or so modules right now. And each one of those modules was funded directly by a user of their portal. They, they had to develop some up front, of course, to attract customers. But then you, know, you, you sign a contract. Oh, well, I, I like your platform. If it did this one thing, I would be able to use it. OK, well, we'll write that module for you. And then make it available to every other customer on the platform. And they're actually very open about that. I can't um, recall if it's in this particular screenshot. Um, but they talk a lot about the fact that this is community-developed software that's helping all of their customers do better at their business. Um, so when, when you pay to have something developed, it is then available to the other customers as well. And I think that this is, this is a very exciting strategy for Drupal-based product development. And, and I'll talk more about why um, later on in the presentation. At this point, is there anybody that can uh, think of maybe a, a product or a product category that I've forgotten or missed? No worries if you can't. <laughs> no? Carlos? No? No? OK. I just I nailed it. Everything. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about what Commerce Guy's products have been and what, what my experience you know, from the inside has been building Drupal-based products. First of all, the products we never launched. Um, it's very, very unlikely that you've heard of either one of these. Um, the first one um, was a product called Checkout Monitoring. And we actually owned, for a while anyways, the domain checkoutmonitoring.com. And we announced it at uh, DrupalCon San Francisco. And then we proceeded to never develop it at all. <laughs> and um, the idea behind this product was you know, we, we're the maintainers of Drupal Commerce. We we're at San Francisco to talk about this, to talk about the future of e-commerce on Drupal. And we're trying to think about value-added services that we can bring that maybe directly extend our module somehow, much like the node squirrel um, option that I showed earlier. And the idea was that you would have essentially an uptime monitor for your checkout form. So if it ever went down or somebody ever uh, encountered unexpected errors, you would get an immediate like, text message that says, oh, your checkout form is broken, or this coupon code that you thought was valid is not working. Something to that effect. It's a decent idea, and it could have worked its way into some sort of an analytics or conversion rate you know, management solution. But we ultimately just never invested any time in developing it. And our CTO, Damien Tornude, was just completely busy on client work so there was really no product vision, no resources available, and we eventually just stopped talking about it. Um, which is a shame, because we actually did have some early traction. We did one thing really right with this product, which was before we started building it, we started advertising it. Which seems counterintuitive, but there's no point in us building this if, we, if nobody even would ever want to use it. So we did amass a mailing list at DrupalCon San Francisco. Um, we, we didn't do much to market it, but we had a mailing list of you know, hundreds of people that were interested in being notified when this solution became available. And so even though this product didn't launch, you know, that was still something we did right. So positive lessons from everything. The next thing was Silhouette. And I actually was really excited about this product too, but never launched. It got a little bit further though, in the sense that we hired somebody to actually um, plan out and build the product. Randy Fay worked for us for a while. Um, and you know, I think Randy Fay probably has a good reputation in Latin America. No, you, you don't know him? Oh man, Randy, he, what do you, oh yeah, you live in Houston. No, Randy, he, he, uh, he lives in Colorado, and once upon a time he rode his bicycle from the top of Canada down to the b bottom of South America. Um, but he said, by the time we got to Argentina, I was tired. So instead of continuing on, they lived in Buenos Aires and for six months just worked on Drupal projects from a lap laptop. <laughs> um, he's, he's a really incredible guy. He actually, he's, he's, he's really good. I love Randy. And so Randy came in, and he specced out this project, Silhouette, which was a PCI compliance assistance tool. The idea being, um, it's impossible for Drupal Commerce as an application to be PCI certified. Um, because Drupal, just by its very nature, um, is, is, uh, count, count, uh, contradicts the requirements of like, PCI regulations if you wanted to use it to actually retain credit card information. Um, so that's, that's why Drupal Commerce projects do not retain credit card data. They use card on file mechanisms, off-site payment solutions, etc. Um, but what we would do with Silhouette was somebody would go to the checkout form and redirect it to our payment server, um, where we would then request the HTML from the Drupal site, present it from our proxy server that, so that it looked like it came from the customer's actual website, but you could securely put in credit card information. We would pass it straight to the payment gateway, and, and then you would go back to the Drupal site, you know, not even knowing that's what happened. And that's why we called it Silhouette. Um, so, so the idea there was just to, to mitigate some of the requirements uh, around um, payment, payment data you know, transmission. Um, what was great about this was that, that Randy spent a fair amount of time specking out the complete solution. And this was like the most detailed product plan we ever had. 
It spelled out exactly how we would build it, exactly how we would market it. And I was really excited about it. Um, but then we got this sort of like premature legal insecurity because somebody saw somewhere that, you know, someone had patent pending on a similar service. And, oh, you know, PayPal is interested in this and these other companies are doing it. And so the, the, the rationale was literally, well, we don't, we don't want to get sued or have to suffer a trademark or patent thing later on. So let's just not do it, um, which, is, which is really like the wrong um, attitude. <laughs> because first of all, that's purely hypothetical. What we were doing most likely would have been different from what anybody else was doing because we aren't stealing anything from them. We actually came up with the idea on our own anyways. Um, and if you get to a point where somebody's suing you because you have copied them and have threatened their market, well, that means you're doing something right. You've actually made a, a big enough business to, to become a threat anyways. So, so really, like, um, you know, I would never scuttle a future product because I thought somebody might not like the fact that I was developing it. Um, but what we did right there was we did, you know, very carefully plan out and document and prepare to build the product. Ultimately, we didn't, um, you know, move forward. Kind of sad. Um, Randy left as a result because he didn't have any interesting work to do then. Um, and we carried on <coughs> and switched our focus to Commerce Kickstart 2. And the idea behind Commerce Kickstart 2 was to take Drupal Commerce and a variety of contributed modules and turn Drupal into an e-commerce application that would compare head-to-head -head with a solution like Magento, um, or Zincart, or PrestaShop, or the other open source e-commerce solutions. Um, so uh, Kickstart 2 is very good for the Drupal community because it showed how to build a lot of different things using Drupal Commerce, like faceted search interfaces, um, fancy product catalogs, responsive checkout forms, and also we used a lot of um, views, customizations on the back end, developed a lot of modules that are now used outside of Commerce Kickstart. Really, it was, it was good in many ways for the community, and it was also good for our business because it, it actually did open up a new revenue opportunity for us that we did not necessarily consider ahead of time. Um, so it's a Drupal distribution. Like I said earlier, distributions have no inherent business model or value, but what we discovered was that thousands of people were using Commerce Kickstart either to learn how to use Drupal Commerce or to actually, <coughs> actually launch real stores. Um, and, and, you know, I, I can think of, you know, a, few dozen examples of stores that took Commerce Kickstart, implemented a new theme, and launched a site, and brought great value you know, to, to the, the merchant um, for very little overhead or little upfront cost. Um, so we were able to um, basically take this market of users and developers and, and begin to bring in third-party service providers like Authorize.net, Lingotech, um, shoot, Fastly, MailUp, and a variety of other um, services that they, they, they do something essential to e-commerce, whether it's email or payment or fulfillment or security, and we then helped them market directly to our users. And as a result, they would pay us marketing money, they would pay us integration costs, and um, by, by the end of it all, I would say that Commerce Kickstart, while it hasn't been you know, profitable, um, was at least a break-even proposition, um, but, it, but it, did, it did cost us much more and take much longer to develop than we ever anticipated. And at the end of the day, it's not actually the best, um, you know, the best solution for launching most new Drupal Commerce sites. It's, it's good if you really fit like 95% of the features it implements. Um, but in general, it's better as a recipe tool, a demonstration tool, uh, maybe a sales tool, but not necessarily a development tool, which is what we actually still need internally. Um, so it's, it's good that it broke even. And, and when I say break even, I would, I would estimate that we probably spent... Um, you know, three or four hundred thousand dollars over the course of its life cycle, um, employing developers full time for six to twelve months to really build it, customize it, design it, um, do usability testing, all, all that kind of stuff. That like we spent a, a lot of money developing it, and at the end of the day, break even, but not something that you would ever build a business on. And that's what we're that's what we're talking about is actually growing a Drupal based product business, not making neat tools that you know kind of pay for themselves but don't really get you anywhere. <coughs> So the next thing in the Commerce Guys product catalog was platform.sh. And this is great. Oh, never mind. It's not this bullet point. Um, well, it's great for that reason, too. Um, it's a very technical product that implements and really, really enforces what we consider to be best practices Drupal development. Um, and not only, not only does it do that, so using Drush make files and um, you know, um, a build process that supports automated testing and other things. Um, but we even um, kind of made a technical leap in allowing the same Git repository that controls your, your Drupal site to also control the configuration of your, service, you know, your services. So PHP, um, MariaDB, Solar, et cetera, 
the, the memory limits, the extensions, and other configurations, you can manage directly from your Git repository. So whenever you push a commit up to your platform, it actually recreates your entire environment, those services included, and rebuilds the Drupal code base, and then, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, I don't even, it makes the site available again. <laughs> I couldn't think of a simpler word for that. Um, and it was, it also, you know, cost more and took a lot longer to develop than expected. Um, we started announcing it at DrupalCon Munich, um, which I think was 2012. And uh, we didn't really open it to the public until j j June 2014, so just last year. Um, so two years after we expected it to be available, um, it was available for self-service. Um, we put our first enterprise customer on it at the end of May. Um, and, you know, so it just it took two years longer than expected. And it was, it was much more technically complex. And I think another thing is, you know, we rebuilt it twice before we launched it. Not, not helpful for getting to market. Um, <clears throat> at the end of the day, though, it's, it's a very strong platform. Um, and it does drive recurring revenue to our business, which is really the foundation of Commerce Guy's future growth. And honestly, the only reason an investor is going to give you money anyways. Um, but, uh, but it's still a, a long ways off from breaking even. Um, not, not only because we had all of our you know, three years of development costs, but even going forward, we still have to support a team of Python engineers and a support staff and a sales force that's just all really expensive. Um, that said, platform.sh is, is for me the, the most interesting aspect of Commerce Guy's future as a, uh, as a product business, um, simply because you know, it, it, it has a natural inbuilt recurring revenue model. And it's such a, such a, a robust tool that it does lend itself well toward enterprise projects and the like that you know, pay a lot of money to have solid platforms. Um, so, that, so just a few lessons learned from these. I'm going to put them all up on the screen. You know, first of all, um, if you want to build a Drupal-based product, well, you have to start building it. Um, you know, there's, there's, I, I can't think of many good reasons not to at least prototype something because prototyping is cheap for us in Drupal. Um, but you know, for various reasons, it was you know managing developer time, managing resources. We just never made it happen. And there there comes a time when you have to decide. Well, um, I, I think I'm just going to go ahead and try something because I think that many of us want to have some sort of a product that is generating recurring revenue and sort of giving us more opportunities for the future. Um, and really, you just kind of have to start. I actually started a, a little side project on the airplane down here, just because I've been thinking about it for months and months. And you know, I finally said, "All right, I've got an hour. I'm just going to start building this." <clears throat> and you know, once you begin to make progress, that sort of breeds its own sort of sense of motivation. But the other thing is to solve a simple problem first, <laughs> and then build complexity only if you need to, um, because for both Commerce Kickstart and for Platform.sh, we were solving very complicated problems. And we were solving them before even having anyone using them, before even knowing who would use them or why. So I mentioned checkout monitoring had a very clear value proposition and had people that were interested in learning more about it upon its launch. Um, for, for commerce, kickstart, and platform, neither of those was the case. These are both full solutions that had to be developed over the course of years and then launched, and hopefully somebody would find them useful. Um, you know, but uh, but if, if we had gone to market with a simpler you know, solution first, um, we could have scaled our development maybe more intelligently, maybe come to market faster. And so when, when I think about you know, the future of, of Drupal-based products, I'm thinking about things that really drive towards simplicity, not change your life all in one fell swoop and do anything imaginable under the sun for an e-commerce project or something. And then also I think... You know, like I said already, that, that there's a better way to leverage the tools that we have. Even with Commerce Kickstart, you know, we, we use the features module to manage the configuration of all of the different parts of Commerce Kickstart. And we didn't even leverage that in the best way that we could have. Um, and it backfires because once somebody uses Commerce Kickstart to build a site, if they customize any of these components that are um, wrapped up in features, um, they can no longer really update from one version of Commerce Kickstart 2 to the next without probably undoing something or at least not getting new changes. So I, I think there are better ways to use the tools that we have. And I think that a lot of the, um, the things that Dries mentioned in his keynote with respect to Drupal 8 really push Drupal forward as, in my opinion, the ideal application framework. So has anybody here built a Ruby on Rails application? No Ruby developers? Um, I've, I've, I've tried. Um, back before I got into Drupal, I actually um, was, was looking into Ruby because my boss who um, tasked me with creating Ubercart uh, was interested in it. 
Um, we ultimately went in Drupal because uh, we wanted more out of the box. Um, but Ruby on Rails is kind of the dar a darling um, in the startup community um, because it makes it really easy to scaffold a web application or a new API. Um, and so, you know, I, um, I live in Greenville, South Carolina, and there's a startup accelerator there. And, and every other startup that comes through is based on Ruby on Rails because they can create an API in minutes and then, you know, throw a bootstrap theme in front of it and then start collecting data and doing something with it really, really fast. Um, so it's, it's a very, very fast, rapid prototyping tool that does a lot of the scaffolding for you. And, and part of the reason it's so good at that is because um, basically, like, once some people started doing that, well, a lot of people sort of piled on and also used Ruby on Rails as a, as a you know, web application development tool. And so then just by having more people doing the same thing on it, um, the tooling got better and better, and it got easier and easier over time. And I think that Drupal 8 is really putting the Drupal community in a position um, to where we can, can really kind of replace Ruby on Rails and perhaps Node.js in some cases as a go-to tool for creating new web applications. So what are we good at in Drupal? Um, first of all, rapid prototyping, even through the user interface, is, is something that we do better than any other tool. Um, you can quickly create your data model, quickly create your different presentation layers, um, and you know, quickly create a web service or REST API based on what you've just done. Um, like I, you know, uh, one, one of my ideas that I haven't uh, just built it yet is called LikeShed. And the idea is it's just a storage container for the things that you like on the internet. Um, using maybe perhaps like a browser plugin um, to record anytime I hit a Facebook like button or retweet something that has a link in it or upvote a link on Reddit. It just puts all of these into one sentiment storehouse where I can manage all of the things that I like on the internet. It, it's in a, in a, a bit similar to like a delicious or a bookmarking service, but it's actually based more around um, maybe, maybe non-tangible actions that you might take. Anyways, um, if I wanted to right now, um, I, could, I could prototype that by creating a content type that has a URL and a user ID um, that has views that show all of the things that are in my like shed and then has a REST API where I could then integrate that into other websites and then maybe start selling myself products based on the things that I like all over the internet. And, and I, can, I can literally build that all in Drupal without writing a single line of code and then I can export it all to features and then manage it as a product. And I can, I can do that. Now, I, I personally wouldn't adopt that approach, but I could if I just wanted to prototype it and prove the model. Um, and so we're, we're really good at that in Drupal. And another thing that we're really good at is managing code and configuration in our source, um, you know, in our, in our VCS. Um, and also testing changes before deploying them because we have these platforms as a service that enforce best practices for DevOps. And we also have modules like features that let us export configuration into code and manage it in our source code um, repository. Um, so we, we're really good at this in Drupal. And um, I'm, I'm not sure what, what the equivalents are in other communities, but this, this does play into our ability to rapidly prototype and manage a Drupal-based product. Um, finally, we're also really good about access control. So the, the Drupal role system and permission system, and then a variety of other modules and things that have been built on top of that, such as content access, access control lists, organic groups, and a variety of other things, make us, make us a, an ideal tool for um, giving privilege access to certain pieces of content on the site, and then you know, licensing out that access to that content to different consumers of the web service. And thanks to Drupal Commerce, you know, even billing for usage of these services and access to these APIs. So we're really good at this in Drupal, which is why products like BioRaft are so cool. Um, because they're, they're basically taking um, all of Drupal's strengths and using Drupal to build a product um, that, that solves problems that they've surfaced in, in their target market. So it kind of depends on you either, either having clients or having personal experience in the market you're trying to target so you know the, the problems, the, the pain points, and can have access to people to propose solutions. Um, but assuming you, you can find those either through sales or personal relationships, building the platform out to solve those problems using Drupal is, is, a, is a very rational course of action. And in my opinion, it's a, it's a very strong course of action. Um, I actually um, consult for a friend's business um, where he didn't have much of the, there, there's no content management requirement in his, um, in his product. There's, there's really not, not much of anything that you would typically think of as, as a Drupal feature. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, maybe we could build this out using um, you know, Node.js and Express, and let's just make a custom Node app to serve up all of your content and reports and analytics. And I began doing it, and I was like, wait a minute, how do you even manage user accounts? 
um, here. Okay, what about an interface for resetting your password? Okay, how about email solutions and so on and so forth? All these things that I take for granted in Drupal, I realized I didn't want to have to build from scratch. I said, look, just build it using Drupal and get all of this for free. And because we can alter anything, you can certainly alter the stuff out that's not relevant to your business or just not enable those modules. Um, but basically, it, it, lets, it lets you, once you have a solution you want to develop, quickly you know, build, build it and then start selling it. Um, additionally, BioRaft is cool because they were able to introduce features based on customer demand and use the Drupal API to create, you know, to, to roll them out in a modular fashion. So picture, if you will, you maintain a distribution that represents your product and you make sure that it's upgradable from release to release to release. And every time a new release comes out, maybe it has a new module in it that you can then turn on for your customers. But you don't give them access to the back end. You just say, look, if you want to enable this module, that's an extra $50 a month. You do that for them. And you know, it's, it's just using the, the Drupal tools and concepts to, to you know, um, you know uh, shoot, charge, charge for the additional features that you're developing and rolling out for your customers. Anyways, what's, what's also cool about this is that they followed you know, customer demand. They didn't just imagine they knew what everybody in their market needed. They waited until somebody had signaled, I will pay for this, and then developed it and then turned it on for them without impacting all of the other users of their software. Um, so I, I really think that they provide an, an example for anyone to follow. And I think that this is true even if your market is much simpler in their, in their requirements than medical testing laboratories um, handling biohazardous material or something. So for example, <clears throat> I haven't fully fleshed this out, um, but one of my strategies for the future is to never build a Drupal website ever again. Because um, I'm tired of building websites where I go get Drupal and I grab some modules and I throw them up on someone's server and say, hey, good luck with that. Maybe once in a while I'll check in and make sure everything is up to date. Um, instead, you know, if I, my, my wife actually needs a website for her doula business. She's a labor coach um, and assists women in delivery. And so she wants to be able to you know, share her stories, uh, market to you know, pregnant moms in our area. And so she needs just really simple content management functionality. But instead of just building her that site, I'm going to create for her a distribution that I just begin to maintain as my own product, my own Drupal distribution, that if anybody else in my family needs a website, they're getting that and not something that I'm building from scratch and then having to maintain for them. And I, I really came to that conclusion at Drupal Geddon. You guys know the, the phrase Drupal Geddon where the seven, Drupal 7.32 had this really bad security fix in it. And so you had to go and update all of your sites immediately. And I realized I had one friend over on HostGator, not in source control. I had two of my own websites on DigitalOcean, one of them still on Rackspace, and a few here, there, and everywhere, two on Pantheon. And I think I had one on Platform SH as well. So literally, like, it, I, like, it was insane to have to go through and, and update all of these different sites in all manner of different fashions. And so I, I realized that I could treat even my own sort of personal customers um, as my target market for somebody that wants a product um, that delivers a simple, you know, content editing experience and, you know, simple brochureware site, for example. And so we're actually going to, to take this philosophy to create a new foundation within Commerce Guys for the work that we're doing. Because um, as, as I mentioned before, um, Kickstart 2 is not a, specific, uh, not a um, sufficient starting point for our majority customer, which is someone with, um, you know, a B2B website, a digital commerce um, website, um, or in many cases, just someone that has a lot of different services they integrate with on the back end, and they don't even use the website itself to administer their product catalog or orders or customers. Um, it's just, you know, there, there's too much that you have to turn off, and because of the way we built the features and because of the way we managed the project, it's hard to take Commerce Kickstart 2 and turn select things off and replace them with other modules. It, it's just, it's just not, not the best experience. And so we are going to start from scratch. Um, with, with essentially a, a, new, a new internally managed distribution of Drupal that actually gives us a launching point for these projects. And instead of you know, taking the Kickstart 2 approach where we just imagine what would every B2B website in the world want out of our platform, um, we will build it up over time um, as clients demand new features, implement them in our internally managed distribution, and, and ideally um, begin to sell what are called managed e-commerce engagements. So that's where instead of paying you $50,000 to build a custom e-commerce website, somebody pays you, you know, a smaller amount on a monthly basis and some percentage of sales. And the trade-off for them is they don't have to make as big of an upfront investment. Um, and your, your revenue is basically tied to their success. And that's, you know, for, for an e-commerce company, that's a much better long-term strategy 
then starting every month at zero dollars in sales, having to hit, you know, at Commerce Guys, I can't even remember, a few hundred thousand dollars in new engagements on a monthly basis, um, you know, and just starting over from scratch every single month. If you can begin to, to you know, amass a, a pool of clients that are, that are, you know, based on recurring revenue, that you can actually improve their website and drive new business to them, and therefore profiting more yourself, it just creates a much better symbiotic relationship. Um, so we'll be doing this internally, um, and ultimately, um, we will want to narrow our focus in the future. Um, so once we have the base functionality covered, which any, anybody can do this. I mean, Commerce Guys is doing this. I'll be doing it for my personal websites, you know, blogs and that kind of thing. And you could do it for any of your customers as well. Um, eventually, we'll have all of the, the, the usual things covered, like pretty invoice emails, faceted search, you know, again, you know, uh, turnkey solution for that. Um, and then we can choose to narrow our focus and create a solution for a specific vertical market. And you know, right now I could say that one of my ideal ones is private content websites, where somebody is selling um, you know, white papers or analytical uh, analysis reports, um, or even just access to content on the website itself. Um, because we've had, we've had many different customers that do that, and they all need the same things. It's um, the commerce modules with commerce license, with the content access module or the um, commerce license file module. You put it all together, and there's, there is in there a turnkey solution that you could actually market as a software, as a service, you know, for um, analyst companies, you know, to sell their white papers. And, you know, once, once you do that, it actually becomes easier to sell because you actually have a target that you're throwing darts at instead of just saying, well, I'm just going to do any e-commerce project. You can't really build a sales campaign around any e-commerce because it, you, you, need, you need some target and some way to narrow your focus um, so that you can... Um, you know, actually chart your effectiveness as a sales force. Okay, so um, I actually have already um, been doing this. Like I said, I, I have um, my friend's company, Bellwether, where he is building an application portal for power companies because he was an energy analyst. He developed a new model for weather normalization, and he wanted, uh, which is just a part of the energy forecasting process, um, and he, he wanted some way to just um, deliver his analysis to his customers, I said, oh, great, here's Drupal. I can rapidly prototype for you an application dashboard that only people from these companies have access to. And ah, since I know how to use Drush Make and I know how to create a distribution, I know how to write modules, you can manage all of this in source code and turn it on turnkey for every single one of your customers on their own version of the site and keep them all up to date as you go. And um, it's, actually, um, it's actually happening. It's very similar to BioRaft, although I don't know exactly how they manage you know, individual customer portals. Um, the strategy I advised them on was just you know, one Drupal site per customer. You could do it a variety of ways, um, depending on the type of product you're building. Um, but it's, it's basically proven the model. Um, I, th I think it's worked. I think it's working for Bellwether. Um, and what's making it work is not, you know, not sort of building something and hoping somebody will then come and find it and use it, but rather you know, going out there and, and I just you know, had them call every utility they could think of and find somebody who needed their tool or something similar and eventually, they, they closed a couple of projects around um, tracking outages for power companies and delivering better weather forecasts and things like that. Um, so similar, very similar to BioRaft, and really my preferred strategy for growing a Drupal-based product business. And the reason being, and these are the, these are the tools that I would recommend, or the, the resources I would recommend for you to learn more, um, is because it's, it's iterative, it's based on um, direct customer feedback, and it's, it's bootstrapped, it's running lean. So the idea here is um, a guy named Ash Maria um, created Running Lean, um, which is um, you know, his paradigm for iterating your way from plan A to a plan that works. Um, so he says, you start every new product that you're developing by identifying a problem and then proposing a solution, finding enough people to say, yes, I would appreciate the solution to this problem. Then you develop the solution and then figure out how to market it, which is how much do I sell it for, who do I sell it to, how do I reach those customers and all that. And so in this book, he, he literally goes through from, from the very beginning all the steps that you would need to, to build, grow, scale a product business. And it's specifically written around um, software as a service businesses, although it's applicable to other um, types of products. And he even did something funny, which was he used this book itself as an example. Um, so before ever writing the book, he actually created a landing page where he said, I'm writing about this. Who wants an advanced copy? And he basically committed to himself that once he could convince 1,000 people to join his mailing list, then he would begin writing the book. 
But he wouldn't write it all at once. He would write chapter by chapter by chapter, get feedback on each chapter as he went, and finally end up with an end product that was first published himself as a, as a PDF you know, uh, e-book. And then he eventually got picked up by O'Reilly, and now he's on second edition. And he's begun to develop a whole set of products that are based around the, his running lean paradigm. Um, and you know, one, one, one word here is that, you know, yea, though I am a part of a venture-backed startup, um, I, do, uh, I, I do much prefer, at least right now, the lean startup method, which is to not just go raise venture capital and try to build something. Because the, the, the potential for um, like a, a misalignment is high. Um, so one of the things that he says is like, you know, running lean, it's, it's not about being cheap and trying to develop a product without ever investing any money. But it's about, it's about being, one, efficient with the resources you have, but also not bringing in external investment prematurely. And it, he has really close to the beginning of this book, and I, I highly recommend that if you're at all interested in building a product business, he basically shows on a, on a graph where you have the, the different steps in the life cycle of, of the product. I, I already mentioned them. It's um, identifying a problem, developing your solution that would fit that problem, then finding a product market fit. And then once you know that you have a product that solves a specific problem, then you scale it. Um, you know, because it's, it's at that point that you're actually ready to go and just basically take money to invest in reaching the market that you already know exists. You've already proven the product is valuable and worthwhile. But it's at that point that you want to start scaling out your resources because if you do it earlier, the money works against you because um, your investors are looking for a return at, at the wrong time. When you're still needing to rule out products and rule out solutions and rule out strategies, you know, somebody's looking to see you growing successively year over year. And so, so I, I really recommend this book, and I also recommend this tool. It's the Lean Canvas. Um, you, can, um, you can try it out. I think it's still free at leanstack.com. And what it does is it gives you a one-page business model where you can sit down and identify, <coughs> you know, from, from top left to around, what problem are you solving? What's your solution? How do you, how do you identify success for people that are using your solution? What is, therefore, your unique value proposition, which is somehow a combination of all these things? And before you embark on building this product, what is it that gives you your unfair advantage? So why would somebody buy your solution to this problem over somebody else's? And this is something that's hard to reproduce, ideally, um, so you aren't uh, you know, disrupted once you begin to prove a market. And then he also has you know, segments that deal with um, who are my customers, what are the channels through which I'll reach them, and what are my revenue streams once I can reach them. So this, this is a one-page business model that's, that's a good practice for you even in evaluating the different things that you think you might want to build. Because if you're anything like me, I have a notebook full of product ideas. Um, I just, like, something comes to me, I write it down, and, you know, eventually I'll get around to basically making a canvas for each one, and then I can decide, well, which one do I invest my time in? And it's going to be the one that, you know, looks, looks best on paper, ideally, <laughs> um, but also it's going to be the one that I have an, an immediate revenue opportunity for. Um, so like with Bellwether, it was power companies needed a service, so the tool came second. Um, and, and then, you know, the, the actual product then, you know, sort of can be developed from there. Um, and another thing to bear in mind, shoot, Paul, does anybody read Paul Graham? He's part of, I think, Y Combinator. It's a startup accelerator in California. Uh, he, has, he has a really good blog post that I recommend, and it's, it's called Do Things That Don't Scale. Um, so the idea is that when you're building a product out from scratch, um, you, you, you have to be willing to uh, you know, basically use yourself and your time and your resources in ways that wouldn't scale. So they, they wouldn't be right. Once you have your product market fit, you wouldn't continue to do things that don't scale um, while you're trying to scale because that's kind of counterproductive. Um, but but in, the, in the beginning, you, know, you could actually take your business model and you could actually you could accomplish it without building a single thing. So in the case of Bellwether, the first customer wanted to correlate... Um, number of customers without power per hour. So, so at 9 a.m. on June 2nd, 2010, how many people didn't have power? Correlate that to um, wind speed and precipitation, and then basically determine how, how weather influences power outages over time. And so the analyst that's sort of developed this whole model, um, you know, he's, he is delivering, he is hand generating the reports using R, just a programming language, um, from scratch, putting the, the results into a Word document, printing it as a PDF, and emailing it to the customer. Obviously could not do that for a dozen different customers, but because he only has only one, until he can do all that automated through some web system, he can do that and, and make his 1500 bucks a month because he's able to do so. Um, so you know, just, just because you have like, the, the sort of grand vision on paper doesn't mean you can't begin doing things up front that don't scale. I, I've heard of things... 
I think it was Stripe, and uh, Paul Graham talks about it in, the, in that article. They would literally like hand enter credit card data for. Or, no, no, I know what it was. They were promising that whenever you signed up for Stripe, you would get a, a merchant account. And it wasn't that like Stripe had integrated with some merchant account provisioning API. They would literally just take the customer's information and very quickly go enter it into a form. Um, and, and, and create these merchants' accounts for their customers. But you know, for the customer, they wouldn't know that it was just the founder of the company doing it by hand. Um, but that's how they were able to get new business and then automate it over time to scale. Um, finally, um, there's a resource called Predictable Revenue. Um, and uh, Predictable Revenue is, is basically um, a, a crash course on creating a winning sales strategy. So if you have a product and you want to take it to market, this book tells you exactly how to do that. Um, from scratch, with no assumptions whatsoever about what you know about sales. And it's written by the guy who took Salesforce.com from $0 in recurring revenue to $100 million in annual recurring revenue. And he basically um, identifies all of the key activities um, and all of the, the types of people you would need to have you know, to, to scale out a new business. Um, but it, but he, he, just, he does it in such a way that it's, it's broken down, it's, it's very clear, it's very useful. He talks about um, a, a strategy called lead prospecting, which is essentially the web 2.0 equivalent of cold calling. Um, but cold calling still works. You know, if, if you know what your target market is, you can get a phone book and you can call people. And so he, he starts you know, even there and just, just basically provides the strategy that took Salesforce you know, to $100 million in revenue. And it actually has um, worked out wildly successfully for a successful Drupal company you may have heard of. In fact, I see at least one shirt here. Um, on the front page of predictablerevenue.com, um, Acquia is a prime case study because Acquia has essentially reproduced the exact same success. Um, Acquia's revenue um, is powered by the predictable revenue methodology, and it's also taken them up to essentially $100 million in annual revenue. Um, so highly recommended. And in fact, um, Tim Bertrand writes articles about this. Like Acquia, you know, one of their strategies is, is to give back more. Um, Dries was telling me this is part of their DNA. They want to give back more, and that extends to every area of their business, not just contributing to the Drupal software, but even educating all of us on how they do what they do. And, and Tim's article around how they're using this model to sell their products and services is, is very enlightening, and I highly recommend you, you know, take advantage of that. I mean, they even share sales numbers, they sell their strategies. They, like, we know exactly what Acquia has done to generate their success. And the good news is that it's, it's literally like it's not rocket science, it's just discipline. And the, the tools and methodologies in both running lean and predictable revenue will give you your start. Now, granted, Acquia raised a bunch of money to do what they've done to scale so quickly. Um, but I think for many of us, the, the, um, the draw is more of a lifestyle business where we can build and maintain a product that supports you know, our lifestyle, doesn't necessarily make us a public company. Although, if that is also your strategy, these are still the same tools that you would use to get there. And one more thing. Um, I, 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 as I said before, I, I really believe that, that Drupal 8 will be the ideal platform for creating new web applications. And um, I, I feel strongly about this one because of configuration management, which Dries talked about, which gives us a very, um, just, just a better way to manage all of the things that we configure and put into code. Um, but also because of the RESTful Web Services module in core, um, giving us much better REST API support out of the box than we've ever had in Drupal 7. Um, so if you're, if you're considering, do I want to build a Drupal-based product? Yeah, maybe. Will it have an API? Yeah, maybe. Um, maybe. One thing for you to do would be to start learning Drupal 8 now and plan to prototype it on Drupal 8 um, instead of either using Drupal 7 or building it from scratch in some other framework. Because as with the Ruby on Rails community, the more of us that decide you know, Drupal can be this tool for our products, then the, the better the tooling will get and the simpler it will be for all of us to continue to do this sort of thing. Um, and that is the gist of my presentation. We've got five minutes or so here to take questions, um, if there are any. Including secrets about commerce, guys, if you want to know numbers or the dirty details. I'm happy to, to dish. <laughs> All right, in that case, I'll make myself available afterwards if anybody wants to talk or brainstorm or discuss ideas. Um, also, Josh is going to be talking about conversion rate optimization in um, not just Drupal commerce, but also just in general. Um, that will be in some other room in 15 minutes. Oh, across the hall in 20 minutes at 2.15. And then if you're interested in the future of Drupal Commerce on Drupal 8, um, I'll be presenting that on behalf of Boyan Zivanovich at um, what? It's after there's like a coffee, uh, after the coffee break somewhere else. Upstairs somewhere, I think. Oh, great. Fantastic. All right, so thanks a lot for your time. 
And, um, you know, hope you have a good rest of your con.